So uh, I guess before I get into the differences, I'll kind of tell you what happened. Um, maybe like a lot of people, when they collected, I found one and I bought one. So that's what got me started to get interested in what, what the, just a preference that before we started. But the time recording devices really got started uh, in the late 1800s in the United States. Um, it kind of came in three different categories. There's the key recorder that uh, Bundy worked on. There's a, a dial recorder, um, first commercialized by the May Patent Company in 1893. And then there's the fluid and brick uh, card recorder, which is probably a little bit more familiar with most of us. But you can see they all happened within a few years. They all started a little bit different as with most technology. Talk a little bit about how they evolved. So one day, uh, you can see there, uh, 1945 to 1907. Thank you. Uh, entered the entered as a as a jewelry business, and he owned his own shop in 1868. He liked to tinker with blocks and all all kinds of gadgets. He has his own steam engine. He has electrical dynamo sawmill, all in the early days of all those kinds of things. So he was just a, a, a tinkerer. He built uh, this clock called his Wonderful Clock, which had uh, a lot of features in it, visible movement, all gold and silver plated. You can see a little uh, picture there. Um, eight belt chimes, professional calendar, two musical attachments, automation, every quarter hour, just your basic little American time and strength button. Uh, there you can see the size of that uh, clock, so it was a pretty significant uh, uh, one that he also worked and, and built. And then ultimately he uh, started to get involved in the, in the time recorder business. Uh, his younger brother Harlow uh, convinced him to start manufacturing these clocks and uh, to market to business owners as a money-saving adventure. So having his hands in so many different things, he really didn't think that this whole idea of a time recorder was anything unique. That was just one of the things he dabbled in. He thought it was really no big deal. He invented the machine while he was working as a superintendent of the, uh, of the fire alarm telegraphic system. He saw the need to uh, record employees' ar arrival and departure times. I mean, that's what a lot of this is all about, to make sure that the company or the entity is getting what they are and people aren't leading one way or the other or companies are cheating them. <coughs> so he started off here with his uh, key recorders. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture of a couple of the old original key recorders. And uh, there's a, a hole there in the center where you'd actually place your key. And your key would have your number on it. So when you look here, you could be key number 98. You'd put your key into that clock, and you would punch it, and it would then be recorded on a piece of paper that the accountant would um, later then give you credit for, for doing whatever that was that you were doing that particular time. So this is the way that he developed his machine. So the, uh, obviously with most startup companies, he uh, would purchase some different things. So he worked with Seth Thomas. And so a lot of the original early movements were actually first uh, the time uh, itself machine essentially just the clock, was uh, purchased from Seth Thomas. And this happens to be one that's actually labeled as Seth Thomas. I uh, had a chance uh, when I was out to the uh, regional in the New York to uh, stop at the Bundy Museum. And all of this was because I had a lot of time clock and I didn't know anything about it. It happened to be out there anyhow as long as you're out there found out there's a couple museums that talk about it. So this is actually Bundy's house um, that's now a museum, and it's a, it's a very diverse museum. It's got his old house, very nice house, wouldn't mind moving into that. It's a mansion-type house. Um, not 
extremely a huge mansion like you might find somewhere, but a very nice house where I think you can all move in and come over. Um, in the basement of this house is a whole bunch of African art. So the guy that owns this house and runs this museum, a huge amount of African art of which I know very little to none about, but a huge exhibit on that. He also has his house over for tour, also has another area in this museum that's on photography and movies. Um, but, of course, the interesting thing to all of us is clocks. So, Harlow uh, got involved. He and his brother incorporated this Bundy Manufacturing Company in 1889. Uh, manufactured and uh, marketed some of the first recorders for recording that time. He's a treasurer and general manager. And eventually the Bundy Museum merged with a number of other companies and eventually uh, formed into the International Time uh, Recorder Company. And eventually that evolved in the beginnings of ID, IBM. So this is the daytime uh, register. This was, of course, a competitor at the time. A totally different machine for doing some of the same similar type of uh, things, trying to record when somebody came to work and when they went home. So it's what you essentially would do is you see on the on the outer periphery diameter there, there's another number. Again, you would have a number. So you'd move that arm there where the lower arrow is pointed to, you'd move that to your number, and then where the upper arrow is, you take a punch in and you say that that was a punch in or a punch out. Again, that would then take a record on a piece of paper that you couldn't see, but the machine could see, and then ultimately the accountant would, uh, would pay you appropriately. So these machines came in various sizes for 50, 100, 150, 200 employees. And this is a, an example where you had a number of these machines uh, for the people to take and punch in at the beginning of day. Now, again, we've got to always put ourselves back in the time period. Um, at that time, men and women were a little bit more segregated, so the men couldn't punch in with the same time clock as the women could, could punch in. So you can see in the upper right-hand side there, there's a, a head bust of a woman, so that everybody know that the women are supposed to punch in with that time clock, and the men would punch in with another time clock. To get the men and women too close to each other. Yeah, I know. I just want to say that well, but uh, that's what the that's what they tell. Well, maybe that's just a, looks like a woman to me too, but maybe not. So the card recorder. Um, again, it, it's all about time is money. It saves you time and money. So the reason why companies would buy this is to take and make sure that they got what they paid for from the employees. <coughs> so the Willard and Frick uh, manufacturing company was actually had a card. So you'd have a physical card that you punched in and punched out so that the employee could see that it really punched in and it did what he, what he wanted to do. So this was a competitor. Um, this is a, uh, a clock. Uh, that's in London, UK. So this was the leading, America at this time was the leading time recording device. So these were sold uh, all around the world. So interesting to compare the different technologies. They kind of conferred the three different technologies that were out there all in the same rough time. Uh, what were some of the advantages and disadvantages? Um, the day machines were a nightmare to repair and service. Dusty re uh, conditions, this is the round dial one, uh, required frequent service. Uh, many of the components need to be removed before you can actually get at that clock. The clock is just like any other clock, it needs to be maintained. That actuator arm in the center made the pendulum design difficult to work around that, and also a lot of stuff that had to come around to get that out to actually clean and service the mechanical uh, timekeeper itself. And of course, the employee couldn't see
see if he actually stamped it or not. So then you always have that question. Well, I stamped it, but it didn't show up. And, you know, there's anything you can do to avoid those conflicts between management and employee or owners of better. The ITR design um, they had a movement that could be removed in, in under five minutes. So essentially, when you call them up and said, I got a problem, my machine doesn't work, they just bring in a new time movement, swap it out. They put the new one in, five minutes later, you're off and running, they take the old one back, clean it, rebuild it, and give that to the next guy that has a problem. Um, key recorder required manual of transcript times, unlike the, uh, the day. So it's, it's all that sociability, being able to see what it is. Uh, being able to have the employees all seems to make sense to us because I'm sure all at one time, a long, long time ago, we probably all punched in with a plant card at one time. So it seems to make so, so sense, but watching the evolution in the past is interesting. Um, and what was the best solution was we'll merge all the competitions, so we'll take the best of this and the best of that, and we'll build our own company. And this was the international time recording company that had all these different, uh, what were originally competing competitions, all kind of merged, formed together, took the best of each, captured the market, pretty much were the market. They, they were the market. If you wanted a machine to record the time, you were going to buy it from them. So they kind of built their own little monopoly. And then once they started really getting formed, it became IBM. And then IBM started saying, well, there's probably other things we can do besides just record people's time. So this is a, an ITR machine here, uh, recording the, the attendance. You can see a mechanical time uh, keeper just up at the top, a typical pendulum. And there was a rod that came down and hooked into the other big, huge mechanism on the bottom, which all had to do about doing the actual recording at the time. There's a, if we got some more pictures, you can probably just faintly see there, but there's a, a red and a black, a red and a blue ribbon over here. Um, that would just help the, uh, the, the accountant to know. Blue means you're, you, you punched in when you're supposed to, and red means you were either late or uh, punching it at a time you weren't supposed to be there. So this is another little uh, blow up here. You can see up in the left hand corner is, is the, the time movement. Um, over in the upper right, it's like a tremendously complex uh, machine. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that as we see some other pictures. In the lower left hand corner is the actual uh, area where you'd put your card in and, and stamp the time. So this is another clock. These, a number of these clocks here in the beginning are all from that Bundy Museum that uh, I showed you with the guy's house. And as uh, we moved into the time card recorders, of course, you'd have a typical place to store your cards. So when you come in in the morning, you punch in, you put your card there, that way if the boss wanted to look to see if you did it right, it's, it's there and available. Uh, one thing, of course, it didn't do, it didn't mean that when I came in and I punched in, I didn't punch in from my button to it. So the, the world's, uh, the Columbian Exposition, which I'm sure we've uh, all heard about, of course, that was a big exposition. Um, to, uh, to celebrate Columbus um, from 1892, or from uh, 1492, Columbus sailed in the deep blue sea, and all those kind of sayings. Um, and of course, that was going to be in 1892, but somehow Chicago didn't get together, and it didn't happen until 1893, because of some technical issues again get there. But uh, Bundy uh, uh, was, again, a late-breaking the new technology of the day, and they needed to be there. That's what the Columbian Exposition was, a lot of new um, tech, technology trying to get there and to exhibit it. So it's the right place to be, but it's an expensive place to be. So uh, one day he decided, how am I going to do that? So he made this uh, little uh, 
display that's uh, pictured there with his clocks. He found out, you know, that what I can do is I can take and provide some of my machines to the exhibition itself, so the employees of the exhibitions could punch in and punch out. Huge number of employees, I'm sure, that took to run that. And so he donated some of the machines, which is how he got into his, into his spot to be able to display his wares. And of course, that was the place to be to display your wares, so that was a very big proponent of increasing his business. So this is a little blow up here of uh, what the display might have looked like. Um, this was inside the, uh, the largest building at the time, at 40 acres under roof, one exposition. So there was a number of uh, documentation in, uh, in the IBM website that kind of showed uh, some of the evolution. This was an area here where they were testing the machines after final assembly. Um, they also used the machines for uh, recording operations, in other words, like a job or any kind of thing, rather than just determine how many hours I work today how many hours or time was used on making this assembly or that assembly. So they found that they could use the machines for controlling their operations and measuring their operations. Um, this is the, the, the factory uh, past World War I. This is the design and drafting area. This is a wee bit before CAD and CAM and those kind of things. Everybody dressed the same. Um, these are the punch presses that were used. By this time, of course, they were making a number of their uh, time movements, but they were making all the time recording device itself. That was something they were making internally. And here's uh, the drill press where they had to take the clock plates and, uh, and drill out all the holes. Self-assemblies, uh, you can notice how each man is responsibility for his complete assembly. So you have all the pieces, you put that assembly in. Again, before the days of lighting, you can see the, the lucky guys were the ones next to the window so they could see what they were doing. Especially as they get as old as some of us, they need all the light we can get to see and put stuff together. So electrical department. Um, and the foreground there is uh, assembling a master clock. And this is just a little version of all the things that uh, IBM was starting to get into and on, its, on its early infancy. So everything has to have a little politics on the side. Not all brothers all get along very well. but. Uh, uh, Harlow, who was more of a businessman, uh, became suspicious when his brother uh, Willard was trying to uh, apply for a patent on a new invention. Um, by law, the way Harlow saw it was anything he invented belonged to ITR. Um, Harlow became furious when Willard says, well, I didn't really do it, my son did, and uh, applied for the patent. So that, that didn't work out very well. So. Uh, Harlow took and fired the, the father and the son. Of course, the father was the brains behind the mechanics of it, and Harlow was the businessman. But because he was a businessman, he apparently tied himself enough to, uh, to uh, capture his uh, brother and to be able to fire him. And so uh, Willard and Son formed a whole new company, and they called it the Monday Time Recording Company. 
And then Harlow sued says you can't you can't use the Bundy name because the Bundy name was from the original company, even though of course that's their last name. And there's always two arguments, so you know, who's the right and who's the wrong in there. Um, and they uh, continued to battle um, until Willard died. And then the battle was over. Um, hardiness is a is a bad habit. This is a whole little commercial kind of thing, it costs money. And of course now with these time recording machines, I knew exactly when you got there. Uh, there's another interesting museum in my quest that was on my way out there. This is in uh, Newark, a uh, small little town. Uh, this is the Hoffman Clock Museum, but it's actually a library. Free museum, you go in, I don't know, a couple hundred clocks, very nice little exhibit. Some guy, I don't remember who it was, uh, donated the uh, collection and left enough money for, to, uh, to keep it maintained. But they had a, a time recorder in there, a little description about it. This is one that uh, was uh, had a mechanical timekeeper, but uh, the mechanics of punching was electric. You can see it's plugged in there. And something else I had never seen in these before. So this is where the something extra comes. It had nothing to do with keeping track of time exactly. But this was a noon cannon. So apparently around 1650, uh, you would take a, a string and you would uh, use it just like uh, you can see there over the picture with the compass. It was. Uh, when the sun would get, what you see there, the, the large dial over there is the magnifier glass. And the sun would take and go through there. It would just be like uh, some of us maybe killed ants and started fires when we were little kids. Magnifying glasses. This would take and burn through that filament when it hit noon and off the cannon would go. <laughs> so I guess it was kind of a little time, maybe that lunchtime when the cannon goes. It worked very well on a cloudy day, so it worked very well as we're walking until today. When the fun's so, far. Uh, so this is where it all got me started into looking into this. Uh, I was at the uh, National last year in Dayton at the auction. And I talked about auction and signing yourself up for maybe selling some things or come and visit and buy some things. Well, I happened to uh, always had a little interest in getting one of these, and so I was there. And, uh, bought it, and they are without a doubt the cheapest clock per pound that you can buy. <laughs> so that clock is 60 or 70 pounds, and uh, none of my kids are home, so that's why I didn't come today, because I wasn't going to take it off the wall by myself. Um, so uh, it's, it's a heavy thing, but it's, it's, it's kind of neat. How tall is it? This one's about uh, three and a half feet tall, maybe. So this was uh, the way I got it, um, the International, and that's just the dial. Um, this is the, the lower base. Um, you can see a little white window over there. That's where you would adjust it for time in, time out. Um, and just above that, you can see the little slot where you put your card in there. And then uh, over here in the foreground, a little brass plate on the right, and a little thumb. So you'd put your card in there, you'd set it up if you were punching in or punching out, and then you push that button and all the mechanics would happen, and it would put a, a stamp on your card from what time you started. Uh, good size, heavy duty movement. Uh, what you can see here, the movement of course on top, and then here's a uh, a rod that goes down, and that's what connects the timepiece with the rest of the recording device. Um, there's a, uh, so a stop works as well as a uh, a winding um, feature here. What you see in the in the right oh, is it's two two main springs to power this thing. Uh, even though it's really only one train, there's two springs that power it. And then this eccentric cam over here takes and moves that other arm up there, which, um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, there was a little window that would tell you how well the, the spring was wound. It was fully wound or if it was, it was down. Um, what I did is, uh, uh, was very careful. These 
rings are thick, but much thicker than if you than I had ever seen before. A lot of force in there. So I took and removed the verge carefully and let it wind down, let it wind itself down. And that's what I ended up with. Well now the force is out of the spring. And now I can think about going through and cleaning it and rebuilding it just like you do any other chemical block. Uh, the bushings were war, and I've seen a lot of war bushings, but this was more an eighth inch. So I literally put a scale inside of there and it was more an eighth inch out, so I needed a new bushing. But uh, that's a lot. We're all used to seeing war bushings. Um, but an eighth inch wear was a lot, so I made a new bushing put that in there. Um, also, uh, just again to try to control this maximum of power is they actually have two clicks on, on each one and a spring to, to keep the click engaged. And uh, this one here on the, on the upper upper left was fine, but the one on the lower right was broke, so I needed to make a new one of those. So uh, I took a old main, a main spring and filed and ground and created a new one. And then this is the mechanism, and you look at that and say, wow, there is a lot of stuff going on in there. And it's really, really heavy. Um, now you can kind of see the, the blue and the, the red ribbon. So naturally, the blue and the red ribbon I had, no matter what you did, it wasn't going to leave any imprint on the card. So finding a new ribbon that was like that was a challenge. But ultimately, with the internet, I found it. And I think it cost less than $10 to put it down. So once I found it, easy, but uh, it was very challenging to do if you didn't have the internet to help serve you. So there are, there's adjustments in there to go from the black and red, and that's what this mechanism is here. You can take and determine that what your window of your employee wanted in to punch in, and did you meet that or not. If you didn't meet in the white window, then it's going to go red and when the time in and time out. So these are all adjustments that were available. And of course, uh, you had to know the day of the week, a.m., p.m. So luckily, all of that worked. So I just kind of blew it out, cleaned up the whatever dust it was, put a new ribbon in, and the mechanics of that worked. Um, so I was lucky there. But now I had this mainspring cleaned that just like any other main spring, but now I had to wind it. And my spring winder didn't look like it was anywhere near up for that task. So what I did is put it in my south bend lathe, which is what you see here, and uh, used, a, used a headstock and put the key into my chuck and used that to take and crimp that over and keep turning it. So I I took my tool post and run a piece of drill rod through the end of that. Put it between the chuck and the, the, the headstock on the left and the tailstock on there. Put the arbor in there to hold that solid. And then just manually use the key to rotate the chuck to, to wind up that spring. And glad that I had that. So then I. Uh, needed to have uh, a retainer to put across it. Um, I actually talked to Mike and he had one retainer up there that you see in the upper right, upper, upper plot. So then I took a piece of 3 8 inch stock and tried to build my own, which is obviously a little cruder in the lower one. But all I had to do was retain the thing. So uh, in winding that, I put the retainers on and now I had uh, the spring under control and I could then put the rest of the movement An alternate method that I also tried was uh, just using a, a double-stranded 32nd uh, inch iron wire to go around to, uh, to retain that power until I got the movement back together again. And so there's the, the movement all, uh, all cleaned and, and put together and bushings created and all ready to go. Uh, maybe see a little bit clearer now the the adjustment here, this arm over here uh, is where that strength uh, indicator would be, and that little T 
tab coming out is where the strength indicator was. So I'll try as I may into the Bundy Museum where they have dozens and dozens of time clocks. So what does that thing look like? I don't know. They're always lost. Huh. Well, don't you have one in this museum? So they look, they talk to them. I mean, I was there for a couple hours talking to them. And I says, well, if you can just find one, I bet you I can copy it, and I'll make you a bunch of them just for letting me see one. Well, they never found one, but uh, uh, I fashioned one, and we'll see that here in a minute. So what I did was just take a, right from the hardware store, a piece of a tubular stock there, 3 three sixteenths by 3 thirty seconds, and took it and, uh, and did a couple of cuts and made a little pointer on it and bent it and painted it red. And uh, found a picture or two, and I think this is pretty much what it looked like, but it couldn't copy an exact one. Um, and it weren't photographed very well. I was able to find one, but I think I got to the point. So now you can see the little red indicators there that would tell you how, well, how far it was wound. And of course, if you didn't keep it wound up, then you had to make all these other adjustments. And uh, not every shop was going to have somebody that would be able to make that adjustment. So you want to just make sure it's just wound well all the time so you don't have to deal with it. Most of the time when this when it malfunctioned, I think most of the people, and certainly that's what the manufacturer wanted to do, call me, I'll fix it. So they would drop another movement in and, and off you go again and make the, so those adjustments. But on the internet, I was able to find the whole mechanical whatever it was, 40, 50 page document that tells you how to set and adjust everything. So, so now it was all complete. I dusted off, cleaned up a few things. And I uh, also managed to get the, in the same auction, I got the, the place to store the cards. And so now it's uh, holding up my basement wall. <laughs> Well, my original, to be real honest with you, when I really wanted to get one of these was uh, I do a lot of work for Laddish, and our, our biggest customer is Rolls Royce. And when I first started there, they had one like this. When you walk in the door, they had one like this. So I thought, well, that would be cool. That was before I was even really in the box. I thought that would be neat. And then eventually they didn't use it anymore, and it still hung there. I still thought of it. Eventually, they said, well, we're going to close this building. And I knew the guy. I worked with the guy that was um, in charge of the building. And uh, he said, well, can I get this? Well, I don't know. Let me check. Well, then it became an international issue. That, so where it is, I don't know. Last I heard, it's still sitting in his office. But um, what I really <laughs> wanted it for is I had teenage kids. And these are very secure machines. There's a lock on everything. Naturally, you didn't want your employees over there playing with it themselves in a row. So I thought, well, this would be perfect, because I can't stay up to the kids when they come home at 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I can stay up. <laughs> oh, I forgot, I forgot to punch in, Dan. Yeah, I forgot to punch in, yeah. But regretfully, by the time I got this box, I know the kids are gone. So uh, but I'll be prepared for the grandkids or something. Like that. So something else I stumbled in in Dayton, um, which I thought might be a little interesting. Uh, went to the Dayton um, Air Force Museum, which they put in some airplanes or something, it's great. But they did have a little horology uh, when I went there. Uh, and this was a clock that was made by a, uh, a prisoner of war, um, U.S. prisoner of war. And he made it out of tin cans and, uh, and cardboard and things he could get as a prisoner of war. Apparently it keeps, kept time reasonably well, whatever that meant. Uh, all out of cardboard and tin can, and the guy with a lot of time on his hands. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So if anybody ever wants to make them, you know, just look at the recycling bin, there's plenty of cardboard and tin cans, and maybe you can sell it in the market. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's, uh, that's all I have today. Uh, any questions? happen to know or have you read anything there is a long apocryphal history of the size of IBM punch cards and when I started in the industry they used to say it was made the size of a dollar bill and then it turned out
I went into Grand and the own cards that were big. And so this all seemed to stem out of the punch card. I, I had never heard this hookup before between I and the other one. You, have you read anything about that, about how they decided on the original size of the card? Was it the size of a dollar bill? Or where the, where they came from with that idea? No, I don't. Uh, I didn't read anything about that. Um, I'm far from an expert on this. Just I got one, so I did a little research, and I thought, well, maybe somebody would want to listen to me at a, at a, at a Chapter 47 meeting someday. But uh, I no, I didn't. Now, my particular one, I was concerned about that because there was only so many cards that I could figure out where to get. Um, and there was a couple that came with the machine, and then I picked up a couple at the at the one museum because so you could punch in. But, well, I punched in, see how it worked. And I, oh, I think I'm home. There's something to put in my card. So then there I was stuck. I had to figure out how this machine worked, and I didn't want to use my my two or three cards as trial. So I just took an old IBM card that we have left an infinite number of those things left over from 30, 40 years ago. Right. And I used it, and it isn't the right size, but it worked. But I would imagine other machines are much more touchy, and I guess if I had a company, I'd want to make sure that my competitor's card wouldn't work in my machine and vice versa, but no, I don't know. That's the story I'm just, uh, yeah. That's right. Else? Yeah. I should know this, but this is a time-only clock, is that right? Or is it? Yes, uh, it's, it's time-only. It had two main no strings main to strings. power that. It did have a bell in it, power, because sure. when you would punch it, it wouldn't ring a bell. But that would only said that you punched it so that you'd hear an extra audit, extra note to know that it means you completed your transaction. Yeah, it's just for longer running time. Right. Two mains. It's a lot of force because, uh, I mean, the, the movement itself is large, but it's got to move this 40 pounds worth of metal to go through all these different functions and checks, all of which on a bad day could all line up to be at the same time. So your movement has to. Uh, overcome that force. What's the duration of the movement? How long do you have to wind it? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a seven days. or eight days, yeah. Okay, well, thanks. And remember, they're the cheapest clock you can buy by the pound. <laughs> <laughs>